Dreaming for God. We all need a God-given dream in our lives. I believe we need a God-given dream personally, and I believe we need a God-given dream for the kingdom of God. It's been said, expect great things from God, then you've got to attempt great things for God. And so today we're going to talk about people in God's Word that live this very way of life. They expected great things from God, but they also tried great things for God. And by looking at these biblical examples, I hope that each one of us will become big dreamers for the Lord. And if you've once dreamed big for God, but you've become discouraged about whether or not uh, those dreams can still be realized, then this uh, message is for you. And these scriptural models that we're going to look at today ought to help you to be able to dream again. I remember being part of churches that had big dreams for God. And they were trying big things for God. They were doing things that only God could do. There were things that they tried that they could have in no way pulled off if it were not for the supernatural intervention of God Almighty. Now, our text verse this morning is unique because it contains the first mention in the Bible of two very important words that I don't want us to miss today. They are vision and reward. And we're going to be emphasizing how being a person of vision will lead to a very rewarding life in God. Genesis 15 verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. Now this verse contains four essential attitudes for fulfilling your God-given dream. And by the way, I would like to think that if we're going to dream, it ought to be a God-given dream. Amen? And it ought to be something that would be in accordance to His perfect will for our lives. The first essential that I want us to look at is realize that your dream will need to be tested. It'll need to be tested. The first words of our text verse deserves further investigation. It said, after these things. After what things? Well, what had been happening in the life of Abram up to this point? Uh, I think we need to quickly review the three preceding chapters of Scripture. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls on Abram to leave his home at the age of 75. Now I want you to think about that one for a moment. You're 75 years old. Many of you have passed that. And God calls you to leave everything that you have and go someplace that He wants you to go and you don't even know where it's at. Some would have said Abram was senile. Huh? So he sets out, not even knowing the location of the promised land to which God is sending him to. And shortly thereafter, Abraham finds himself right in the middle of a famine. Now I can just hear the people. See, Abraham, we told you you were nuts. We told you not to do it. We told you you were too old to be acting like this. Now you're in the middle of a famine. Good enough for you, Abraham. Isn't that the way people do? You set out to try to be obedient to the Lord and everybody just finds a million reasons why you cannot and should not do it. He's forced to take his family and his servants and his flocks and his herds and go into Egypt. And while he's there, he lies about Sarah being his wife. And he tells them that she is his sister. And the reason is so Pharaoh won't kill him. 
Now, let me, let, me, let me say this. If you're 75 years old, and you just know God's telling you to leave everything you've got behind and go to a land that He'll show you, why would you have to lie to cover your own skin? So Abraham's got a little test here. Pharaoh takes Sarah into his harem. But God protects her in spite of Abram's deception. And she is returned to Abram untouched. Now this character fall of Abram's is not covered up in the scriptures. And I think that's one of the many reasons we know the Bible is true and trustworthy. And that's that the Bible just tells it like it is. Amen? Amen? Abram was weak. He lied. There's no excuse for his lying. Yet Abram did not stop his journey to obey God because of his own sinful nature. So we see in Genesis 12 that Abram's dream was tested by famine and failure. How many of us would have given up by now? Huh? In Genesis chapter 13, Abram separates from his nephew Lot because of a range war that erupted between the herdsmen. There wasn't enough grazing land for both of them to set their herds and flocks, so Abram lets Lot take his pick of the land to which to graze, and Lot chooses very foolishly. He did pick the lush land. He did pick the best land. But it was also connected to that wicked city of Sodom. Eventually, Lot inches his way into the city. Listen to me very carefully. It was gradual. He sees the land, and he doesn't pay any attention to all the warnings that God laid out before him. The biggest warning was Sodom. Now Lot's got a family, and he's going to put his family out there under the influence of this wicked city. And eventually he just keeps getting closer and closer and closer. That's what sin will do to you. Something will come along and you'll think it's the greatest thing ever. And you'll think, if I don't seize this opportunity, I'll never get that opportunity again. And you rarely stop to ask God what His perfect will would be. So you do it anyway. Now, I've seen this happen over and over and over again. I've seen people make a choice that was foolish, just like Lot's choice. And I watched them gradually and slowly inch away from God. They begin to shuck their responsibilities. Church isn't number one anymore. God isn't number one anymore. And the next thing you know, they're gone. Amen. And that's exactly what happened to Lot. Well, Lot's family life is completely devastated because he chose the wrong priorities in life. Abram could have taken pick from his... He, he had seniority... But he was very selfless. Don't be so sure just because you can do something that you should do something. So in Genesis 13, we see that Abram's vision was tested by conflict. Conflict. In Genesis chapter 14, Abram rescues Lot from being taken captive. The kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot and his family had been living, lost their battle to a group of Babylonian kings. 
As a consequence, Lot and his family among all the other people were going to be taken as slaves. So Uncle Abraham puts together a little army of his servants and he rescues Lot and his family. After the battle, Abram meets a man by the name of Melchizedek. He's the king of Salem. That's in verse 18, by the way. King Melchizedek possessed a couple of very unique qualities. Number one, he was also a priest. The only other priest king in the Bible is Jesus. Secondly, no one could trace Melchizedek's human origin. He couldn't be traced. That's why Hebrews 5, 6, which is quoting Psalms 110, 4, emphasizes that Jesus was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He wasn't from the normal high priestly line of Aaron. Jesus was a priest king of supernatural origin. He was the only priest without human sin, which is the only way that Jesus could be our Savior. So what does Abram do when he meets this Christ-like figure? First thing he did was pay a tithe to him. In fact, this is the first mention in the Bible of someone given 10% of their money as an act of worship in Scripture. It occurs 400 years before Moses established tithing. So you see, tithing is not under the law like a lot of people like to say today. You know, I've heard preachers say, oh, tithing's under the law, therefore we don't have to tithe. Well, it's not under the law. Abraham tithed 400 years before Moses said that we needed to tithe. Abraham worshipped God by giving and by tithing. But this wasn't the end of the mastery of his stewardship. The king of Sodom offers for Abraham to keep the spoils of the battle that he had just won. Well, they were already Abraham's. And Abraham said, I don't want it. And you know why Abraham told him he didn't want the spoils of the battle? So that he, that king could never say, I made Abraham rich. Abraham, Abram wanted everybody to know that his God gave him his wealth. He was able to refuse those material goods based on principle. Thank God for men and women of principle, of integrity. We have people in this church of high integrity. And I tell you, I am very respectful of them. And I look at them as a gift from God Almighty. So we see Abraham's vision was not only tested by famine and failure and conflict, but his vision was tested by warfare and prosperity. <clears throat> If Satan can't get you by hardship, he'll get you by prosperity. For some reason, we have something built into us to be able to put up with a little bit of hardship. And we've realized that that's the devil trying to get us to uh, work away from God. And we just brace ourselves for it and get through it. But prosperity is another question. I've seen Satan use prosperity to take down some of God's biggest giants. Money. Things. Things. You know, that's why there's so many false preachers on TV today. Because of things. They're greedy. They have no love for God whatsoever and they don't have an ounce of love for the people that's sending them all the money. They're greedy. And they twist the scriptures 
so that people will put money right into their wretched hands. And Abraham wasn't going to have no part of it. He said, you're not going to hold that over this old boy's head. God's the one that gives me my wealth. I don't want your wealth. And he refused it. Not many preachers would do that today. See, that's the stuff that comes before the afterword in Genesis 15.1. Afterward, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision. After all of these things took place. Do you see the pattern here? After Abraham stepped out by faith and left his homeland, after he'd been through the famine, after he embarrassed himself by lying about uh, Sarah, after he had the dissension with his family member Lot, after he had fought and won the battle with those Babylonian kings, after he passed the test of his possessions, and after those tests... God appeared to him in a vision. You're going to have to understand if you've got a dream, it's got to be tested or it's not worth having. Amen? Amen. After those tests, God comes to him in a vision. Now, a lot of us would have already given up. After we'd gone through just one of those tests. And that's the reason why a lot of dreams for God never materialize. We just give up too quickly. When we realize that our dreams must be tested, we can have a better attitude about those tests. And a positive attitude is essential for realizing our dreams. So if I do a lot of heart searching with the Lord concerning the church and things that we need to do here and maybe programs that need to be started things that need to be done and I ask God to give me a vision and a dream for that right off the bat I've got to understand that that dream and that vision will be tested and I need to understand, while I'm going through the test, God is for me, Satan's against me, and I've got to cast the deciding vote. You're going to be tested. I tell this to new converts all the time. They accept Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, and they're excited about what God has done. They're excited about heaven, and they want to serve the Lord some form or fashion. And I let them know, you will be tested. Expect it. Because when you accept Jesus as your Savior, you immediately in, enter into a spiritual warfare. Amen. And the battle's on. But you've got to understand, God's for you, Satan's against you. It's you that cast the deciding vote. Those that see their God-given dreams fulfilled are the ones that persevere through those tough times. They're the people that refuse to quit. They're like Jacob who wrestled with God, and they, he wasn't going to stop until he received God's blessing. So we got to keep wrestling. That's the biggest difference between winners and losers in every field of life. In business, in marriage, in family life. And a lot of people do succeed because they have a positive attitude about their test. Now they're not always the most brilliant people or the most talented. And they're not always the better skilled. And they don't always have the best resources at their disposal. They're just people who refuse to let go of their dream. God's will through the patriarchs or any other saint was never realized overnight. It took years of testing and molding and refining until they realized their dream. Why do I have to be tested to realize God's dream in my life? Because God can't give his dreams to people whose minds are cluttered with other things. 
He needs our undivided attention. Here's the part that bothers me. When I hear somebody say, I'm going to do this and I don't care what God says. I deserve to be happy. I want to tell you something. I want to be happy. But when it comes to God's will, I'd rather be happy in heaven than happy here. You look at all the patriarchs. They all had problems in their lives. They all faced obstacles. They faced mountains of problems. But they were overcomers. Then you read Hebrews 11. Not only the people had faith, but all of those that died not receiving the promise. Why did they always skip over that part? They were beheaded. They were sawn asunder. They were boiled alive. And yet they kept the faith. Our tests and our trials are never meant to discourage us. They're meant to draw us closer to God. Psalm 34, 17 and 18. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Tests are nothing more than God's pruning shears. That's all they are. Abraham finally came to the point in his life where God could say, Abraham, I want to talk to you about something. And he had his undivided attention. It was the afterwards, after the storms of life. Abram passed the test, so God gave him a vision. So the first attitude to realizing your God-given dream is realize your dream's going to be tested. And then number two, remember that God offers reassurance. Every now and then we need reassurance. Especially when you're going all alone. You're trying to pursue the dream that God has given you. You're trying to do what you know God wants you to do with your life. And you end up having to do it all alone. Nobody else wants to come along beside you. Scripture says the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. Nobody's ever seen God. God is a spirit, and he's not contained in a physical body, except, of course, when Jesus took the time to come here and take on human form. But God often used visions and dreams to speak to people. Besides that, Abraham didn't have the Bible like we do. He couldn't go to Genesis and look this stuff up. There was no Genesis in that day. So God spoke to him in a vision. You realize you and I have got it better than Abraham did. God will speak to you every single day if you'll read his word. You've got more revelation from God than Abram ever dreamed of having. And what's going to happen when you hear from God? A lot of good things will happen. One of which you'll be able to face your fears. Fear is the greatest enemy to realize in your God-given dream. In fact, fear is a dream killer. That's why God's communication to Abram included this next attitude. Thirdly, replace fear with faith. God said, fear not, Abram. And he's saying to you, fear not. I am with you. What would he have been afraid of at this point? I don't think it was the retribution of the kings. He had already defeated them in battle. And it wasn't the wrath of the king of Egypt about his wife. Abraham already survived those tests. The greatest of Abraham's tests was his test of faith. God promised to make him a great nation. You know the problem. Abraham and Sarah were too old to have kids. How could God 
possibly hope to fulfill his a promise to Abram now. Now, Abram believed the Lord, but he still wondered how God was going to pull it off. So Abram suggested to God. Now, that's, isn't that ironic? God, you haven't had my, answered my prayers. and I want to tell you where you went wrong, Lord. <laughs> if you would have done this, this, this. Can you imagine such a thing? But people do it. Oh, yeah, they do it. And so Abram suggests to God that he use his trusted servant Eliezer of Damascus to become his heir. And Sarah had a plan too. Why don't you just have a father by Hagar? Boy, that got us all in trouble. That's why we're in the mess we're in today. Both plans missed the mark. Both alternatives were motivated by fear. I want to tell you something. When God says He's going to do something, He's going to do it. Amen. Regardless of where we're at in life. When Darlene's 80, and I'm 81, Darlene, God said we're going to have four more kids. <laughs> It's just me and you, baby. <laughs> so remember, replace your fear with faith. The fourth essential attitude to realize your God-given dream is recognize that a great reward waits for you. In our text, God says, I am thy shield. A shield is for protection in battle. But the battle in which God wanted to protect Abram wasn't a physical battle, it was a spiritual battle. In fact, Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And what is this shield in our God-given armor? Ephesians 6, 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In order to win that spiritual battle involving the realization of our God-given dream, we're going to have to believe what we can not see. Do you all remember when you were in that little storefront down here in town? Yeah. And your pastor told you that they were going to build a nice big building here on this property. You believed that by faith. And you were able to see this building before it was ever built. Were you not? Because of faith. And what God was able to do. And what God has done. And will continue to do. We're going to have to believe what we can't see. Let me give you a little story. Walt Disney's widow was being interviewed after the completion of Disney World in Florida. And a reporter said, isn't it a shame that your husband never got to see this? And she said immediately, he did see it. That's why it's here. He saw it right here, and he saw it right here. And you and I have got to start seeing God working in this place by faith. Even though we don't see the actual result, we have to believe that he is working. Amen. And he wants to use all of us. People that keep their eyes on the prize get to see what other people cannot see. Amen. <clears throat> I could use me as an example. You know, there's people today that still say I'll never make it. I got saved in 76. Oh, he'll never make it. He won't last. And when I sense God calling me to preach, 
There was other people said, there ain't no way. It ain't going to happen, Vanover. But I believed it. I knew what was going on inside of me. I couldn't get it out of my mind. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't concentrate on my work. God had given me a dream to preach His Word and win souls to the kingdom of God. I was the only one that could see it. Don't you dare let somebody else convince you that God does still give dreams because He does. And don't you let anybody beat you out of your God-given dream. Others will disappoint you. They'll let you down. They'll put you in a position that you don't want to be in. You'll have to make choices and decisions that you'd rather cut off your arm than to have to make them. But don't you let anybody steal your dream. Abraham was one of those people. He saw what others couldn't see. Let me ask you a question here. What dream has God given you? Do you long for your family and friends to come to faith in Jesus Christ? Don't you ever give up on that dream. Can you see God helping you overcome your family problems or maybe financial problems? Do you dream of God using you in some bigger way? I've had people come to me, I'll never let God dictate my life to me again. What? All right. Remember that when you have to stand before him. Amen. I've seen people fall out of love with Jesus. And they were so vibrant. And they got people around them excited about the Lord. And what they were doing for the Lord was exciting to them. And now it's drudgery. Somebody stole their dream. Never give up on your God given dream. Heaven depends on you fulfilling your role that God has called you to fulfill. There's souls somewhere out there that aren't going to make it to heaven if you give up on your dream. Somebody is going to miss heaven if you walk away from what God has called you to do, somebody's going to miss heaven. And I'm going to tell you something else. You walk away from God's will in your life, don't you think that your family life's going to be all hummy-hummy? You're going to have problems. Abraham found that out. And don't you ever get to the point where you think you know more than God. I hope and pray to God that we all get a God-given dream given to us to be what God has called us to be. Somebody's spiritual future depends on you fulfilling your God-given dream. Let's stand. Are you still excited about what God's given you to do? Or is it becoming a problem? Is it becoming something you'd rather not have to mess with? How are you doing with your witness to other people around you? How are you doing with that? What does God have to do to get our attention?
For some, God's going to have to do something very drastic. Just to get him to fulfill the role that he's called him to fulfill. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, would anybody be willing to raise their hands? You know what, Pastor? I used to have a dream that kept me going. I mean, it motivated me. It moved me. It was my life's blood. But now, it's a distant memory. Thanks for joining us. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Also, follow us on the Mixler app and on Facebook. Or visit our website, lighthousememorial.com. God bless.